Hi and welcome to my wee channel, The Wandering Kilt. Today's video is Strun Rar in Dumfries and Galloway. I think I've been here once before, but it's not a place we would have travelled to as it's about two and a half hours drive from my house. So it's a bit of an adventure for me as well. Its position on the shore of Loch Ryan has always been important for the growth of Stranraer, and the loss of the ferry port a few years ago has been detrimental to the town. But thanks to funding, it is starting to blossom again. Known locally as the Toon, quite a bit has happened through the centuries. Robert the Bruce fought the Battle of Loch Ryan in early February 1307, sailing in with more than a dozen ships, but the invasion was not too successful, with many being captured and later executed. By the 1600s, Stranraer was the main market town for Wigtonshire, and a military road was built from Dumfries to the town. I've travelled on this road and it's not really the widest, making it difficult passing cars and vans. The reason for the road was to allow a faster journey to Port Patrick, to facilitate the plantation of Ulster. Now that was a plan that was constructed to quell the Irish that involved throwing people off their land, similar to the Highland Clearances. Rather than the land being taken over by sheep, they were to be farmed by Scots Protestants and loyal subjects from the north of England. The thinking was that the introduction of English-speaking people loyal to the Crown could only help to civilise the local population, especially in the so-called Six Counties. By 1630, the population of settlers, or planters as they were called, was estimated at over 80,000, which meant there was a steady stream of people through Stranraer and Port Patrick heading towards Ireland, that is, until the plantations in Virginia, America started in 1607. Most people opted more for the New World as opposed to Ireland. The first harbour in Stranraer was not built until the mid-18th century, with a larger development in the 1820s. The advent of the steam engine with the railways in 1861 finally secured Stranraer's place as the main port in the area. Rail links to Glasgow cemented the town's place as the main Scotland to Ireland port for over 150 years. The Second World War brought plenty of action to the area, the North Channel being of strategic importance as almost all convoys from abroad passed through here, bound for Glasgow or Liverpool. The U-boats were a constant menace, whether through torpedoes or mines. And Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister of the day, flew to America in a flying boat from Stranra, visiting President Roosevelt in America. The Castle of St John is a medieval tower house in the town centre, and it's almost impossible to miss. It has been a house, a court, a prison, and lastly used as a garrison during the time of the Covenanters in the 1600s. It has been safe from demolition and you can walk around inside, and if you're fleet of foot you can climb up all the steps, which will give you some impressive views from on top. The other historical building is the Old Town Hall, built in 1776, which is now a fantastic museum, and I would allow a couple of hours to enjoy all the exhibits. There's too many for me to name, but the town has its own semi-professional football team as well, unsurprisingly called Stranra FC, with the home ground being called Stair Park. The town has always had a strong curling connection, and indeed it had the first hotel with an indoor ice rink in the world, built in 1970. Notable people from the town include the radio officer from the Princess Victoria, which was a roll-on, roll-off ferry that sank in appalling weather on the 31st of January 1953. David Broadfoot was born in Stranraer in July 1899 and he stayed at his post with complete disregard for his own safety, continuing to send messages to pinpoint the sinking ship's position. He was posthumously awarded the George Cross, which is the civilian's highest award for bravery. And in 1999, 100 years after his birth, his grandchildren graciously donated his medal to the local museum, where it is pride of place amongst other memorabilia. So the big question is, is it worth a visit? 
As the biggest town around, I would say yes. I liked my time here. The folk in the museum and the tower are very friendly and knowledgeable. And there is quite a bit to see. I can imagine years ago when the Irish ferry left from here, it must have been busy with cars heading across the water. Sadly, that metaphorical ship has sailed and the financial impact on the town must have been colossal. I'm from Bathgate and when the biggest employer, the British Leyland, closed in the 1980s, it crippled the town. But towns are resilient and both Bathgate and Stranraer are making a comeback. I guess you just have to roll with the punches and adapt to what people need from local shops. Crikey, I don't have to go on, so hey, let's just get on with it.
Well, that was Stranraer in the sun. I must admit, I really liked the place. There was lots of nice cafes too, and while we sat in one of the cafes, we looked at the tower in the town centre. Thinking about when it was the headquarters of John Graham of Claver House, also known locally as Bloody Clavers, for his shocking treatment of the Covenanter. The area is still busy with almost three quarters of a million vehicles travelling through the area annually. Sadly, not too many of them stop on their way to the Cairn Ryan Ferry. The surprising thing was, while Stranraer was the first hotel with an indoor curling rink in the world, it was also the last senior football club in Britain to have floodlights installed, and that was as late as 1981. While I was down here, I visited Port Patrick, Wigton and Stranraer, and I enjoyed them all, so look out for those other videos. Thanks very much to everyone who's commented over the last two or three videos, it's always nice to hear from you. And as I look at the big clock on the wall, I see that once again, time has beaten us, so until next time, bye.